Thanks for the introduction, Evgeny. Thank you all for coming. And staying so late, I'm going to talk about information embeddings. And here is our agenda. So first, we're going to talk uh, how can we use embeddings in music domain. We're going to talk about why do we need it, how can we do it, and how we apply it. And we'll try to answer the question, how does Spotify recommend us the music we like? And then we'll switch to, um, to the main of words and texts. And we'll talk about word embeddings and try to discover how Google Translate knows all the meaning for all the words. So let's go on with music embeddings. And let's start with a situation which might be familiar to some of you. Uh, imagine that you're in your office, sitting at your desk, working hard, and listening to your favorite music. Uh, let's say you try to you like to listen to classical music when you try to keep the concentration, and that would mean that uh, your Spotify recommendation list would consist of a bunch of different classical composers. Uh, then suddenly your phone st starts to ring, and you realize it's an important one. So you jump out of your desk uh, to pick it up and leave your laptop unattended and unlocked. And the one thing that I didn't mention before, you have really nice colleagues with a perfect sense of humor. <laughs> so they simply won't miss a chance to go to your laptop and massively and randomly click on the tracks that you probably don't like. So when you're back from your urgent call, you would found the list of recommendations in Spotify looking somehow like this. Uh, <laughs> And it's really fun, but it actually raises an important question of uh, how can a computer distinguish between classical and metal music? So for us humans, it's quite obvious. We can easily say that Bach and Beethoven are related to classical music. They both have uh, quite complicated arrangements. They both perform by orchestras, like a big amount of people. They, only, they have low amount of repetitive patterns and so on. And you can easily say that metal music is something different because uh, it's much louder, it has heavy drum patterns, it's, it has distorted guitars, screaming vocals, you name it. But for a machine, it's really a problem. You cannot, a machine cannot apply the same logic. They need something, some help, some hint from us to help them uh, convert this complicated and structured information, which is music, to something digital. And digital can be operated by the machines. And this hint is exactly the embeddings. So what is the embedding? Embedding is a numerical representation of some entity. So here are two examples. One is the song embedding. You have the song californication, and you represent it with the set of numbers. We call it a vector. Or let's say you have the word mother, and you represent it with another set of numbers. Uh, how can you do the embeddings for music? So what would be the simplest idea to convert music into something digital? You can look at the content of the song. You can try to analyze the sound spectrum. You can look at the lyrics. You can, always, you can also try to label everything with different genres and then use it for different purposes. But there are also obvious disadvantages of it. Uh, first of all, the algorithms for sound processing are quite complex. Uh, then sometimes you listen to instrumental music. It doesn't have any lyrics at all. And also, if you want to label everything, it would be a bunch of manual labor, which is not fun. Uh, but fortunately, there is another simple approach, which is called collaborative filtering. Uh, so what is it? Imagine we're Spotify, and we want to recommend our customers what to listen to next. So we collect all the historical data of what our customers have been listening to before, and we put it into this table. And the one in this table means that this user likes these artists. For, for example, Mike likes Beatles. And the zero means he doesn't like, so Mike doesn't like Beyonce. But also, we observe a lot of question marks here. It means that this particular customer haven't listened to this particular artist before. And that's actually the point of our interest. We want to predict it. Uh, so the main idea behind collaborative filtering is very simple. Uh, we look at the Mike and Kate. And from the fact that they have the similar opinion on some subset of the artist, we imply that Kate would follow the opinion of Mikey about the Beatles, the artist she never listened to before. So now we can fill this question mark. If we keep going the same technique up till the end, we would have the full table with only ones and zeros, no question marks. And 
the column on this table would be exactly the embedding of the artist. So here the embedding, the numerical representation of fractal chili peppers is highlighted in green. So these collaborative filtering techniques and embeddings, they are highly, widely used in different musical services, Spotify, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, Last.fm, all of them. And there are typical use cases for it. So first use case is recommendation. It's when the user asks a question, what to listen to next? So we look at this metrics, we have a lot of question marks, we fill it in with ones and zeros, and then we output to the user the, one that, the ones that he probably would like. Uh, next one is uh, called start. It's a problem when uh, the customer just registered into the system and Spotify doesn't know anything about him. You have no history for this user. Uh, what would be the way to deal with it? Uh, so Spotify would give a little survey to the user. They would say, hey, this is 20 very famous bands. Please say which ones do you like, and we'll go on from it. So you, as a customer, make the ticks. Spotify then grabs this preferred uh, artists, create embeddings out of them, and looks for the most similar embeddings. And then they would suggest you to listen to these bands. Uh, next application is uh, playlist generation. It's when a customer wants to listen to something which sounds like Linkin Park, but it's not actually Linkin Park. So Spotify grabs one of the songs of Linkin Park, converts it to the embedding, and then looks for the most similar embeddings. And then he would create, uh, he would take some batch of these similar ones and put them into something which he would call uh, Linkin Park radio station. And everyone is happy. Another application is uh, friend suggestion. So I'm not sure about Spotify, but Last.fm does it for sure. It's when you're a user and you want to follow someone who has a similar interest to yours. Uh, so if we would look back at our table, we would see that every row represents the embedding uh, of the actual customer. So we would take Kate's embedding, look for the most similar ones, and suggest her to follow these guys, and probably they would be friends. That's enough for music. Let's switch to the second part of our talk, word embeddings. Uh, we're gonna look at we're gonna briefly look at one of the approaches how we can create a numerical representation out of words. And the main idea of this approach is to use the context information. So what does it mean? Uh, imagine you have the word fox, and you're interested into in creating the representation of this word. So here are the several. Uh, sentences about Fox. I think I grabbed them from Wikipedia. And uh, you observe different words around Fox. So let's say dogs, animal, habitat, brown, predators, habit, and so on. And uh, each of these words, they contain a tiny piece of information about the word Fox. And that's because they, uh, they're quite close to the word Fox. They occur together. So you can say that these words uh, represent the word Fox. Uh, let's try to generalize this idea. So we're trying to analyze the huge text, and we put this text into this table. So columns and rows would be the words from this text. Of course, it's just a tiny piece of all the table. And what are the numbers uh, in the table? So each number shows us how many times these two particular words occur together in this text. So that's our fox. And this row of numbers would be actually the embedding for the word fox. So what do we see? We see that fox and quick, they often occur together. Also, we can say that brown often goes together with fox. But for example, lazy, the value is very low. So uh, you rarely see fox and lazy together. And when we would create the graphical representation out of this table, we would need to take into account. So here is our fox. And around, we can see brown and dog. And lazy is a bit further. That means that lazy that folks are not lazy. They are less lazy than they are brown. <laughs> <laughs> and another interesting observation is that lazy is closer to the dog than to the fox. So it means that dogs are more lazy than foxes. And it probably makes sense because foxes are wild animals. They need to run more than dogs. So how can we utilize this approach, this knowledge, into, in uh, real-world applications? So first of all, if we look at the distances between the, wor uh, the words, we can try to create the synonym finding, synonym matching. So football and soccer would be graphically represented very close to each other. That means that the meaning of them is very close, and you can say that one is a synonym for another. 
Uh, second one is uh, we're trying to observe the direction between the words. So we see that the direction from the country to its capital is always the same. That will let us to answer a simple question, the questions like, uh, given the fact that Paris is the capital of France, what would be the capital of Spain? And we just go to the Spain and follow the same direction and we would see there Madrid. If we would apply the same technique to the whole sentences, but not to the words, we would be able to create chatbots. So the chatbot is some service which talks to the customer, customer has his question and chatbot gives him an answer. So we have the question from the customer, we embed it to some numerical representation, and then we are looking to the closest embedding, but from the answer space. We would get the closest answer and output to the user. Another interesting application is about languages. Here, uh, I'm sorry for the not very perfect graph. The font is super low, but believe me, there are some words in English on the left side, and on the right side, there are the same words, but in Spanish. And what you can see that uh, the position for the word one, for example, is really close to the position of the word uno, which is one in Spanish. And the same goes, uh, you can say about any word, like four and cuatro, cat and gato. And this idea is actually one of the basic ideas lying behind uh, Google Translate algorithms. So you, can you take the word in English, you create the embedding out of it, and then you look for the closest embedding, but from the Spanish vocabulary. And that would be your translation. So to recap, uh, one thing that I want you to take away from this talk is that embeddings is something, uh, is some concept that allows you to convert some complex and unstructured information into digits. And digits can be understood uh, by the machines. And this concept is applied in different domains. So translation, Google Translate, we just talked about it. A virtual assistant, for example, Amazon Alexa, it's actually a combination of acoustic embeddings and textual embeddings. So you have the question, you can, uh, the system converts the audio to text, also with the help of audio embeddings. Then you have the embedding of your question, and you look to the closest embedding from the answer space, and you give this answer back to the user. Recommendations, it's about the content, the musical content as Spotify or video content as Netflix. So you have your movie in Netflix and you wanna be suggested by similar, with similar movies. You have the embedding of the movie, you look to the most closest embeddings and it would be your output for the user. Image similarity, it's like when you go to Pinterest and search for the new outfit, you start with clicking on some picture, the outfit you like, and then Pinterest would show you much more of the same, much more pictures which look closer to the initial one. How do they do it? They grab the embedding on the picture you clicked on, they look for the closest embeddings, and they output all the closest embeddings, the pictures with the closest embeddings to you. Yeah, actually there is much, much more. You can even try to embed the human character and use it for partner matching service. But unfortunately, or fortunately, one question would remain unanswered. Would you need to match the characters <laughs> <laughs> the characters which have the similar embeddings, or you need to match the opposite ones. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Igor, for your, for your talk. It's a very nice picture to finish the presentation, actually. <laughs> so uh, we have some time for questions. So some would like, someone would like to ask a question, please. Hello. Um, more, um, well, I'm not sure if this is more goes into kind of your domain or not, but um, especially for, so for music, music embedding, why isn't there like a huge random button? If you want to discover something that's completely outside of what you like or like on YouTube, why isn't there, why does it always give you just the same thing over and over again? I'm not sure if you know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I don't work for Spotify, but probably like, you know, in the old times, Google had this button, get lucky. So you type anything and they get lucky and it would be random. And I think at least you have, at least Google Play Music, they, has, they have the same radio station. I think it's called just get lucky radio station. So you just press it. And I think it's based on your previous history, but not super related to it. They would recommend you quite random music. So probably that would help. <laughs> Some more questions, please.
Thank you very much for your talk. Um, question about the start knowledge. To be able to do that kind of thing, you need to to get the information, to, to collect some initial, let's say, amount of, of just, you know, knowing things. So before you do that, so it's just wild guesses or there are some smarter ways like, okay, I have nothing about that guy. I do have one time information. I do have time 10 times or yeah, now I'm lucky. I do have a thousand times interactions with my service. So how those stages look like? Yeah, I think it's a really nice question. So it's always better to have more information than less. But if the user rejects to go through the survey, for example, at least you know his login name, probably you know his gender, maybe the age group. If you apply some different third-party databases, you may know some of his interests. That would help us to do something. Yeah, it's about Google. But if you know nothing about him, I think the only way to go is to pick your popular tracks, artists, and to give it to him. Because otherwise, if you know nothing, then it would be the way to start. So some more questions, please? Oh, please. Um, question about uh, how does, for example, Spotify classify something as uh, not liked by the user because uh, if I like something, I download it or I favorite it. But if I don't like something, there's really no way of showing that I don't like it. I may just listen for a couple minutes and then decide I don't like it, and then I just close it. But <laughs> like you know, sometimes it happens, but it doesn't mean that you don't like it. Well, now I'm really sorry for Spotify because actually I'm a user of Google Play Music, and you have a dislike button there. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, actually, I think they edited it. Actually, I'm using Spotify. Really? They have it now. But another way would be like I think Google does it automatically when you start listening to the track and you almost immediately switch to the next one. They automatically uh, mark it as dislike. So probably the amount that you spend listening to the track would be the implicit feedback. <laughs>